What is going on, people? We are Tottenham TV here, back again with another preview stream for you guys. Spurs take on Newcastle at St. James's Park. 12.30 kickoff tomorrow on the weekend. Very, very big game for Spurs in the top four race. Joining me today for today's live stream, as you might have noticed, to my... What is it, my right? My right... To, it's your right, my left. Um... <laughs> No, <laughs> I'm just looking on screen. It's my left, but it's the, it's the viewer's right. It's the viewer's right. Uh, ben is not here, no. as you might have seen. This isn't Ben. This Went is for the more handsome addition to the, to the team. We had we needed a major call up. Some some call it an upgrade. Some call it a downgrade. No, some say what. <laughs> some no says what we that. doing. What we thinking? <laughs> Got brains McLeod in the studio today. What's cracking? Helping me go through the game. Brains, how you doing? Yeah, I'm just going to do your role today. Uh, you do Ben's role. I'll just sit here claiming Richarlison's a good player. Uh, <laughs> That's all I do. Bring, bring Tangai and Dumbly back. <laughs> bring him home, all that nonsense. Brains has a catalogue of all my muddy takes. And oh, he's, just, he's ready to reel them off, them I think. Got them um, All right, so... We have got, before we get into the preview, we've got an update to go through. Then we'll go into predicted lineup. Then we'll go into a preview of the game and our score predictions as well. But without further ado, let's start with a Tottenham update. Let's look at some of the transfer news that has been boiling around Spurs over the last 24 hours. We'll start with Tom Barkley from The Sun. He says, I understand that Spurs are keen to secure a quick deal for long-term target Conor Gallagher this summer as Ange Postacoglu hopes to get his business done early and Chelsea's PSR pressures could make it happen. It's a story that just won't go away, isn't it, in terms of Conor Gallagher. He also mentions that he uh, Spurs hope they could get him for as little as 40 million pounds obviously Chelsea the rumors are that they are in big financial trouble when it comes to um, the profitability sustainable uh, ruling um, from the Premier League there are also talks that the rules are changing this summer but um, from next season they're going to remain the same when it comes to Conor Gallagher is 40 million a good deal for you do you think it's worth doing at that kind of price because he's got a high ceiling, I would say he's worth forty million. Um, but I just, I think the, I think the move for him is to go to a team in and around where they are now, and then and ball out and be the man. Can he come to a top four team and improve that team? I'm not, I'm not too sure. Mm. You know, I think he's. Yeah, is he better than Saar or Bentancur? Ben does he get just does he, does he walk right into this team right now? I don't think he does, but I think he's a bit more offensive than those players, and mm. maybe he gets into a bit more goal-scoring positions than those yeah. players. More energy, and he, and he also has a lot of energy. He's a really great presser. I think Andrew would love that side yeah. of his game as well. And I think second half of this season, he's really starting to score goals now. Um, I've, he's always getting those positions, but his finishing's been a bit off. But recently, um, he's definitely started. I think you know, I, I remember Villa in the FA Cup. He scored Palace away. He scored uh, recently against Man United. He scored as well. Mm. So he's definitely starting to score a lot more. More consistently, yeah. yeah. So he's starting to put those chances away now. And if he can do that, be that kind of midfielder who makes those late runs into the box. Like, if it's between him, Bentico and Saul, in, in in, for, for a chance to fall to any of them in the box, I'd rather it fall to Gallagher than yeah. either of those two. If anything, that's the one criticism of Saar is that he doesn't score enough. Mm. The good thing about, um, you know, when Andrews at Celtic, his eights his kind of two eights if you want like they would crush and win the ball high back high and we haven't really done that mm. enough well know? you say that I think we're top of the league for like regained in the opposition half right, fair so. enough I mean Sar, I mean in the early start of the season I think we were doing it a lot mm. so maybe a lot of the stats come from them but lately we've not really been putting that foot down high up the pitch mm. and that's where someone like a gallery come in and really improve us there. But obviously the question that always um, plagues this kind of transfer is, will Gallagher want the move? Will Chelsea deal with Tottenham? All these different things. The fact of the matter is Chelsea might have to deal with Tottenham because of their troubles. But do you but want that? Is... Do you want a player coming because the club has to sell them? Does he, can you imagine him wanting to come to Spurs? Mm. And you've That's seen, the thing that doesn't yeah. really sit well. And I agree you. with that. And you've seen it even recently, like um, players who kind of make that move where not because they really want it, but because the club want to sell and it doesn't really work out. And yeah. they end up even going back or moving on very yeah. quickly. And you don't want that to be the situation either. He's a Chelsea fan. He grew up around Chelsea. True blue his whole life, yeah. So is 
spurs the kind of move he wants to be making. That's a decision he has to make, um, I guess. That, and I, that's the one thing I think is the main thing that, that, that puts doubt for me whether he, this deal will ever happen, which we've said a million times. But I can understand Tottenham wanting it. I can understand Chelsea wanting to sell. Yeah. I can't quite see Gallagher wanting to come. Because those That's are the like thing. the corporate entities of, of the game. You know, mm. they want to get the deal done. But he, he's a player. He come, he, he's about heart and soul just like the fans are. It's like, can you can you put it together and make it work? Obviously, it is their job, but you don't want you don't want a player thinking like that, oh, it's a job, well, wherever I go, I have mm-hmm. to go, you know? It's like, no, you want, you want them to have that heart and soul of the team, you know? I don't know. I, for me, I, it's, there's no smoke without fire, but and it doesn't seem to be going away. But is it not going away because it makes for a good headline, or is it actually true? Like if Man United come in last minute and stop him the cash, is he just going to go there? You and know I think what I mean? he would make. I think their midfield is a state. He could mm. improve them. They don't mm. have legs in the midfield. Mm. He, he could be a better signing for them. So that's, that's that's the kind of feeling I have. Look, but we'll have to wait and see. As we say, the story is always there. It never really goes away. Yeah. So m- there's surely something to it. Next one, we're going to be talking about Pablo Torre. And according to El, um, El Nocias, which is a Spanish publication, they're saying that Tottenham have now submitted a 30 million euro bid for Barcelona midfielder Pablo Torre with a view to the player joining the club ahead of next season. Barcelona have not yet responded to the, to the proposal from Spurs. Tottenham have now submitted... Yeah, so yeah, uh, Barcelona have not... Uh, uh, um, responded to the proposal. Um, 30 million is quite a high, high price. He's obviously a 20 year old <laughs> playing right now for Barcelona. He's actually made 20 appearances this season. Uh, for Girona, for, yeah. Exactly. For Girona, yeah, and having a really good season. Um, is this one you expect that Tottenham are serious about? Because obviously we're looking at the next generation yeah. of talents at the moment. Um, and there's this, like Barca say this, you know, there's a lot of people at Barca, like Xavi and stuff, who say this is the next Pedri. Um, but I think the more interesting thing is that we're in for these types of deals where we're not going in the market. I think so many fans want us to go out there and just get, like myself included, just go out there and just get a 50, 60 million pound player who who is the difference, you know, who's a world class mm. talent who could take the game by the scruff of the neck. But that doesn't seem what our uh, scouting strategy is. It is go and find the potential youth who could be that player. So get them cheap and then they become the 100 million player, you know? Mm. Um, but that, there's a huge risk ratio going on right there because what, you know, it worked brilliantly with Pappy, but it took three years for it to work mm-hmm. with Pappy. So 30 million for a player who you might, does he come in straight away? You know, well, at 20 years of age, you'd probably think he would come to the first team at that age. You'd be in the squad look, for you, sure, yeah. you know, you look at the players we have at the moment playing yeah. a doggy, as you say, Saar. They're all uh, Van de Ven even. Yeah. They're around that age, and they're in yeah. the first team, and they're being trusted. The problem is, though, you've got Bergval coming. Is he yeah. going to be part of the first team? But look at the makeup of the types of players they're going for. Like These are like highly technical players, mm. workhorses as well, who fight. So technical like fighters who you can imagine playing in the eights. I don't see any of them as he's in a yeah, central attacking midfielder mm. as well. So it's interesting that we're we're looking at these types of technical whiz kids. You know, the next you think of Pedri, you know, of course you'd love to have a player like that. You know, so mm. but it, it's just whether or not. I mean, it's there's a bit of smoke there. It's a rumor that's kind of been going around for the last couple of days. But thirty million for a twenty year old who's not really broken through. Shemtan says, "Sounds like another Brian Hill." I hope, I hope it's not, <laughs> I hope I think it's not he, I that think bad. Because he comes from Barca's academy, I think mm. he's way higher, highly, highly mm-hmm. rated. You know, and the fact is, that he is in Girona and he is actually having a great time in Serie A. So, so maybe one to keep an eye on. But be very interesting because I don't think we'd get we'd sign Conor Gallagher for forty and then sign him for thirty as well. I mean, I'd be very surprised if that yeah. was the case. Um, Next up, uh, a, f- a story from Ali Gold. This is about Tosin Adarabayo, and he says Spurs are expected to step up their interest in Fulham's Tosin Adarabayo ahead of a potential move at the end of this contract in June. Tosin is understood to be open to joining Tottenham, which is quite interesting considering last summer, the, the pretty much him his unwillingness to come to Spurs seemed yeah. to be the only thing that was holding up the deal because it seemed as though Fulham were ready to take the money from Tottenham but he wanted to join Monaco and didn't want to join Tottenham um, mm. I've been very impressed with him this season I think he was injured up until like January yeah. he came back on the team and it's really Fulham have really improved since he's come back into the team um, I think he's now 26 years of age Tosin uh, he is kind of predominantly a right-sided centre-back but 
I have seen him play on the left before. I understand Spurs, the main interest from him is just because it's a free transfer. I'm guessing it's probably mm. too good to turn down. Yeah. But he is a good player and he probably would fit in at Spurs. So how do you assess this kind of deal? Because you would think Spurs would probably look to sign a left-sided centre-back or left-footed centre-back, considering we have Dragosheen there now. Mm -hmm. So would Tosin be the kind of defender we should be looking at in terms of to help improve our squad or the squad depth? I think it's like if you can get a player of his quality and mm. his ceiling on a free, I think that does become a little bit too hard. To I mean, what well, you're going to turn that away just because he's not a left-sided player. I, I, I think his quality coming into that squad, he could push on the right side and maybe the left side. He's aerially dominant. Mm. We don't have a player who really wins every duel in the air like he does. So I think he, I think he has a good player. And I, I can imagine that he was looking at last season and going, mm, I want to, I'm, I'm a starter. I want to go push, you know, and play every game. Especially if he was coming back from injury. He felt like he, you know, I don't want to go somewhere and sit on the bench for a while. So you can to totally understand why, he, you know, wasn't feeling Tottenham. But you know, you've seen posts from him before saying how good are this Tottenham team and stuff. So um, I think if we can get him, get him. Mm. You know, you we, we wanted him before. We were after him. Just get him. Do you think he's that level? You, yeah. uh, do you think he, yeah, he, he improves the squad? You are going to play mm. a lot more games. You know, I think you, you, you know, you, him and Drakus, Drakusen in, at the back is not a bad little pairing. It's know? not a bad backup, but if I could mm. get like, let's say, an Encapier, I know it would be a lot more money. Yeah. But are you like, talking about free or because how much is because Encapier is probably going to be upwards of 50, 60 million, I would say. Yeah. But the thing is, Encapier, he can also play left back <clears> potentially and centre back. So yeah. there's two backups like covered there. But if you can save that 60 million and then spend that on other areas and get Tosin in, a quality mm. of him in, you know, and then mm. go and spend that 60 million on two thirties or, or just a 60 million player, you know. Mm. I it maybe it's worth go, it. Go I can understand that. the temptation to do that, just get a backup uh, centre-back in, you get him for free, you've got a good quality on there, yeah. and then you can really invest in other areas. Like Especially as this scouting or... team's looking through its targets, and obviously if, a t if it was your target last season, it doesn't mean you st it stops being your target. Mm -hmm. you know? And if all of a sudden, you know, that was the, the risk, it was like put, a, put an offer in for him, or wait and see the deal run out and then get them. You know? So mm -hmm. I, I, I would say I would be shocked if they aren't just trying to negotiate that deal right now, just get them in. It'll just be the player's what he wants. Mm. You know? Be interesting to see if yeah if that ends up happening because I think he I think other clubs could definitely offer him a starting space more than Tottenham. Obviously with Romero Van der Ven there, mm. it's not going to be easy for him to be starting. But as you saw this season, you know Romero suspensions, Van der Ven picked up injuries. There's going to be and also we're going to have more games next season, so it definitely yeah. will be game Ample time for opportunity. him. He'll, you know? he'll probably easily get 25 plus games. Mm be interesting to see how that one plays out um, a number of clubs are reported to be interested and the last story we're going to be talking about is Pup Mate San this is um, quite an interesting story uh, reporting from Ali Gold he was thought to have been for next season because this next season will be his third year at the club mm -hmm. um, the assumption was that next season he would then go into the homegrown category because you'd have to be uh, trained by the yeah. club for three years to count as homegrown but according to Ali Gold that is not going to be the case because um, according, apparently, the rules state that you have to have um, been three years at the club before the age of 18. Now, obviously, he joined the club at 18 and went out on loan. Mm. And he did join, uh, and, and he was, um, sorry, put as an under-21 um, as a club player while he was out on loan. And that was thought to be sufficient enough to count as him being trained at the club while uh, before he's 18. Bef and so next season, he'll count as homegrown. But apparently because he's not an EU player and, and, and because of that, he actually didn't have the right to work in the UK. That meant that he actually, those years doesn't count as towards being mm. trained at the club, which means actually next year, he's not going to count as homegrown. He's going to uh. have to go into the non-homegrown category, which is a bit frustrating considering Spurs have had their issues now with the homegrown quotas and all these different things in terms of meeting those specifications in squad depth. So that means the hope that he would be homegrown for next season isn't going to materialise and that means maybe it's going to um, heighten the need to dip into that, that homegrown market for next season. 
It's frustrating. You're saying call it Conor Gallagher and now he looks... Uh, maybe, well, maybe that could be another reason why someone like Gallagher is obviously more of needed. Obviously, yeah. we, I know we're going to look for more English players. I don't know, on the market, English players, um, obviously, they do command premium. Um, and obviously, English players that we need... There's always someone like Eze, but he's going to be a big fee. I'm Gibbs not, White. Gibbs White. Maybe those those are the kind of players we might start looking yeah. for. If, if Forrest go down, they might have to sell Gibbs White for mm. around. The same as Madison, 35, 40, you know, and mm. then just grab that. Yeah, but it's not obviously not a position you want to be in because you don't because it shortens your pool of players mm. and that will obviously drive the price up of, the, of that pool of players um, because they know you have you're looking for those kind of players. So yeah. it remains to be seen how we kind of go about that for for next year. Let's hope. Well, Ange says he was commented on his post match um, pre match press conference said they they feel comfortable about the situation they're in in that aspect. So he doesn't seem worried about it. But in terms of the, the numbers of what and the quota, we don't seem to be in the best position. So. Yeah. Be Does that help too. Skippy then? In terms it potentially, of, but he's, he's he, asked about it. he was saying it doesn't for him it doesn't hold too much of a bearing. But in theory, it should give him more of a value to the squad. Mm. For the fact that he's homegrown. But if you're only in the squad because you're homegrown, yeah. that's not a position you kind of want to be in. Um, but look. That is your Tottenham update. Let me know in the comment section below what do you think of all the stories we talked about today. Um, let's uh, read through some of the comments. Paul from Singapore says, "What Ali Gold? What did Ali Gold say in the video? I thought he said there was a chance Pape may not be homegrown, but added uh, that he will check. Yeah, so apparently he's not homegrown. That's what that's what um, he was reporting in his. Um, he just did an article. Um, Simon Alster says, no reason not to get Donnelly and Devine involved next year. Yeah, maybe that's something we can do. Maybe that um, if we put them in the first team, they can count as yeah, their own players. I, I think you improve your first team with some, some really good solid signings and then you can have a little bit of space in the squad for like four or five mm. homegrown uh, youth players. Mm. Um uh, Riz, uh, Rizik says Gar Gallagher is a terrible player and does not improve them um, d um, well I, I don't know if he improves them but he improves the depth I like Gallagher I think he's really improving uh, Donovan saying brains hiding behind the sofa for this match uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, to be honest look let's I'll get we'll do the predicted Accurate. lineup first I think <laughs> We'll do. We're doing the predicted lineup first. Um, Just because I'm, I hate that kit though. And uh, no look, let's, so yeah, to, first of all, that kit, and there's a lot of PTSD from last year. Yeah. Look, we'll go, let, let's go in the predicted lineup. So. Ange um, confirmed the team news in his press conference, and unfortunately, Richarlison remains injured for this game, so he will not be involved. I would say, unfortunately, Brain <laughs> says uh, maybe more fortunately, <laughs> and he obviously joins the long term absentees of Solomon, Sessignon, and Fraser Forster. He did comment that. Um, Richarlison should be available over this mini break we have because of the FA Cup next week. Mm. Obviously, Man City um, play uh, in the semi-final, so they're we can't play them, so we have a bit of a break. Yep. So he said Richarlison should be fit after that break, but he also said that Richarlison should have been fit for this week, and he wasn't. So we'll have to wait and see. Do you 100% do you believe in the injuries with Richarlison? Or is I mean, I've got no reason to doubt it. Um, but he was, he, was, he was totally back. He was saying he was back. Andrew was saying he was injured. That he came on, played a little thing, and then he was out again. What's but well, what I would say is, when he got called up for international duty and didn't play a minute, so that lends me to believe yeah. that he was still struggling with that injury yeah. on international duty. So clearly, he's suffering with something with his knee. I think that was some, something he's been suffering earlier with the season. Maybe it's a reoccurrence, which would be a big shame. That, that makes this season quite an injury-prone season for him. Correct. Because first part of the season, you know, he was suffering a lot with those injuries. He mm. Then he had surgery, came back from it, um, has been brilliant for that uh, for about a 10-game spell. This, this would be his third or fourth injury then. Yeah, he's had a few injuries, hasn't yeah. he? I, I, I think that's something to consider when when it comes to um, offers in the summer potentially. Yeah. If if he's not him right off his purple patch that he was on because he yeah. was on a bit of a tear and then it's like constant stop start in out. Got mm. tough for him. All right. Well, let's get into the lineup. We'll start off in goal. No surprises here. Obviously, Guillermo Vicario um, will be starting in goal. And uh, obviously, to cast your mind back last year to. Um, 
the game against oh. Newcastle and uh, Lloris I think conceded every shot he had and yeah. um, went off at half time so Vicario will hopefully looking at do you reckon he'll be watching that game back and thinking I don't want to go through that <laughs> I, I hope that none of them are, are I hope that game's just been wiped from the memory of every <laughs> Spurs fan's mind it was such a Oh, it's a hellhole of a show to watch. And that was the game where, I mean, we kind of thought that uh, Hugo was going through the yips, but that was the one where it was like, wow, he really it's is. Clear. It is yeah. clear now, yeah. Um, so hopefully Vicario can banish the memories of last year sure with can. a much better goalkeeping performance. On the right-hand side of the defence, obviously Pedro Porro, we're going to be having him in the team, no surprise there. Um, he will be up against... Uh, Anthony Gordon, who's you know been in good form this season, yeah. who's a good dribbler as well, who's going to want to take him take on. Take him on. So he's yeah. got to be wary of that, hasn't he? Yeah. Pedro Porro. I don't like that matchup. I think, but Gordon isn't really good at, at tracking back and defending. So again, in attack, I think Porro's got some opportunities there. Fall into the half space and look for mm. balls through the, the through the lanes. But honestly, I just I worry sometimes with Romero and Porro going back together. The two of them quite quite regularly get caught out and mm. just like one's either too far forward or one's not forward enough. Um, there's always space around them that, that you know, they kind of don't seem to communicate that well on. Um, so I'm a little bit worried about that side of their attack, mm. if I'm honest. And also off the bench as well, potentially Harvey Barnes to come on if, if, if uh, you he, know. He's then. another player who's an absolute tricky tear customer. Right now, yeah. So got to be careful there. Um, obviously, right side of the defence, you've got Cusi Romero, yep. I, and I think it's been under the radar how good he's been recently. Obviously, Van der Ven's been getting a lot of the plaudits, but I actually think Romero has been con quite consistent over the last few weeks. Like consistent, high quality. Obviously, his passing out the back is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but and uh, Alexander Isak is going to be the opposition yeah. on the weekend, like. He's in scintillating form as well, isn't he, Isaac? But when you watch it, do you not think, like, I have this suspicion that Ange is kind of telling or, or giving license to Romero to step into the, the half space and then just go, mm -hmm. you know, and, like, go after things and win balls there, mm -hmm. you know, rather than sit, 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 you know, like, he goes and ends kind of steps Because he knows like if, he, if he misses role. one, then Van yeah. Ven's and a... that, so he's got... Uh, VDV behind him it's, but that seems to happen quite a lot and it is a bit of a high risk game but the the award is amazing because if he does get it then we're through you know mm -hmm. we're away so um, but then this game is maybe something that you know Van der Ven's got to be really tight on on Isak yeah, yeah, no surprises. Left hand side of the centre back is going to be Van der Ven. So, how do you expect that match up to go? Uh, them two against Alexander Isak, who has shown his ability to um, get the ball to feet, run at players. Yeah. He's also could be quite physical as well. He's also been quite good at you know getting on the end of crosses. So he's a real big threat, isn't he, Isak? So how do you go? How do you think these uh, uh, um, centre backs are going to go about dealing with him? You reckon? I think I've, I'm like Van der Ven is the one player in this team where. Not the one player, but like a player who I just I have a lot of confidence in, mm -hmm. you know. Until you start seeing making loads of mistakes, I, I never. I, Max, he probably makes maybe one mistake in a game, which is unbelievable for mm -hmm. a footballer. Um, but he is a tricky customer. But I think the the way that he backs up, look, it, it kind of like holds the player up, watches him, and then he puts his foot in. Like I, I'm back in Van de Ben on this. I hope that that isn't like you know, <laughs> famous last words, but just on his form compared to other. To, compared to Isaac, he's on good form. I still think Van der Ven ha has it over him. I think mm. Van der Ven's going to be all right. It's uh, it's if uh, Isaac decides to start making diagonal runs in behind. Last week was an example of um, Van der Ven got pulled a little bit far out, and then mm. there was a gap. Romero comes too far over, and then there's a l lack of concentration at the back post, and then that's where Anthony Gordon could kind of slip in. So mm. if they use as uh, Isaac as a kind of bit of a false nine at, at times, or try to get in behind could be dangerous for what you could do with the kind of inside reverse ball backwards so yeah it's a that's a tough one that one but yeah. uh i'm, I'm backing the lads <laughs> To stay strong. Yeah, I think that that area, Isaac and Gordon, uh, that's the, the big big danger area. Obviously, left back we're gonna go Destiny Udoggy. Um I did I felt I felt like against uh Forrest, obviously it was caught out quite badly for the goal. Mm. Uh, obviously, and I think in this kind of game he's gonna probably have Miggy ammo run, I'm thinking, on that old left hand side. So I he, that's gotta be a situation where he has to feel like he can dominate that side. Yeah, shortly. strength wise he should be able to completely his game is to like rush a player off the ball. He should 
run away with that. Mm. He's but he's had he's had up and down form in the last mm. few games, you know. I agree. I mean, I don't know if it's been a while since he's had that the start of the season form where he was picking up the ball and running mm. through players and going up and starting attacks. That's the guy you kind of want to see back. But you know, Amaron is has, has shown he can he can go on a nice little streak. So I wouldn't let him, give him too much space, but. I think this should be a good game for, yeah, for Destiny. That's why I hope so. Um, in the number six position, we're going to go for Eves Basuma. Obviously, there's a bit of a debate going into this game because... Yeah, this is the big debate, isn't it? Yeah, yeah because good. Basuma came off a half-time against Nottingham Forest. Hoybier came on, and we actually really improved after Hoybier came yeah. on. Um, but we have just sided with Eve Pesuma in this game. I guess the the tilting thing is Hoybier does seem generally better when he comes off the bench, yeah. which tilted it in Pesuma's favour. And has also said that he he felt Pesuma did okay in that first half. He just felt like we needed more legs, so he brought on Hoybier. Um, if it was your decision, what would you go for in this game? I think I can see the sense of Ange kind of, you know, whipping him at half time and then starting him again. Mm. To say like, you know. You can't just play in little spots. You've got to be solid for for the whole game, you know, or else you just come out, you know. Mm. So hopefully it's lit a fire under him. Um, and worst case scenario, you know, you do have Hoybier to come on. I thought Hoybier came on and really steadied the ship. He made a couple two mistakes. Mm. It's not no biggie, but uh, yeah, I just I want to see Basuma not play nervous and concerned and I, I want I want to see him play with that how he was at the start of the season because he, he had the ceiling at the start of the season of being the best midfielder in the league he's got mm. that in him it's just how does Ange get it out of him is this how he gets it out of him by whipping him at half time and mm. then putting an arm around him bringing him back on that's why I can imagine it's going to happen but it's just it's on Basuma on on whether he can recapture that confidence. One thing I think he needs to work on, which I think Hoybier is actually quite good at, is is I feel like Basuma, from a defensive point of view, is quite reactive. He do, he doesn't like when the ball comes into midfield he's not like pouncing on the opponent yeah. he's quite good at like when they're running at him he can make the challenge yeah. but when but when he's trying to be like proactive and like stepping ahead of people and, and getting Tottenham on the front foot mm. I feel like Hoybier actually does a bit of a better job at yeah. that kind of stuff but I feel like Basuma can cover a bit more ground than Hoybier so it's kind of swings and roundabouts so I think Basuma yeah. needs to work on you know make, making sure he's tracking his runners all the way into the box being yeah. a bit more proactive and getting Spurs on the front foot that's a big part of his game that of late that I've thought has been the worst side of it where mm. he's like on his heels mm. so a ball gets played and he's, he's waiting and then yeah. someone gets in ahead of him it's it's like he's not really following the game right and it becomes a problem because actually I was looking at I was comparing um, Hoybier's average position to Basuma's um, in the Forest game and Basuma's was like 10 yards in the opposition half and wow. Hoybier's was like 10 yards in his yeah. own half and when you're a reactive defender and you're pushing that far forward and you're yeah. not being on it when it comes to defensively or letting people bypass you, that's where the problems in transition can yeah. come. So maybe that, that was a problem. But I do think Basuma, I do think he's going to go with him. I wouldn't be, I, I personally actually in this game would go with Hoybier just because I feel like uh, Newcastle's de- midfield is so depleted. If you had someone like Hoybier just go on top of you yeah. and like put pressure on you proactively, that might be a better fit. But I, we're going with Basuma because I feel like Andrew's going to go with Basuma. You know what's really interesting in football, especially in midfield, is partnership. Defence is, is massive as well. Two mm-hmm. centre backs. You have to get a good partnership between you. You see, like, Van Ven and Romero seem to have a really good mm-hmm. understanding. Midfield, it's all about that. Mm-hmm. And I thought it showed perfectly last week. At the start of the season, I thought. Uh, players like Yudoji, Basuma and Saar had this beautiful cross play mm. like mentality of knowing where they were you know and Van de Ven had a great link up with Basuma when Hoybier came on the other day you, you saw just how good him and Benson could play together mm. like just knowing each other longer and like it being that little a few yards deeper, which Benton Kerr likes, because then he can turn and just go bang, and he just played these lovely little triangles. The passing just moved faster, faster, mm. faster. And uh, I think that you, it's amb- it actually is, that makes me think that's a big reason why. Mm. The fact that Bersum- uh, Hoiberg will take a little step deeper mm-hmm. to kind of see the pitch, because he knows he doesn't want to play yeah. with his back. So he'll take a step deeper to see where... I don't think Basuma really likes kind of running with the whole field behind him, and mm. then he's pressed, and because yeah. all he's doing is pass here, pass there. It's a bit simple. Mm. And you can imagine that getting a bit boring for a player, you know, where he wants to just turn out and right. go, you know. So um, it's just it's. It, I think Basuma is the better player if he's on his confidence is on fire. Mm-hmm. And then I think he's just you know, but it's if he's not, if he's fifty percent. 
you can get some real bad things happen. You know, the couple of things that happened in that Forest game, you know, in the half, we, which was, I thought, the reasons where he got pulled, they could have been straight up goals, you know. Mm. One thing I think, uh, before we move on, um, Newcastle don't really play with a natural number 10. So yeah. maybe um, Basuma will be more comfortable with not having someone take up those little half spaces. Yeah. Um, next up, we're on the right-hand side. Uh, we are going to go with Ben Tankor ahead of Pat Mate Saar. Um, interestingly, obviously, Basuma got hooked at half-time and so did Saar last time. We're thinking Ben Tankor is going to come in. We're just thinking, but I think Ben Tankor is starting to show some really good form, yeah. I think, lately. I thought the opening against West Ham, he was brilliant. I thought when he came on um, against Forrest, he was um, outstanding. Saar, I'm not saying Saar's playing badly. I just think Ben Tankor is showing a bit more at the moment. And obviously, away from home... Um, he has that uh, strength and ability about him. So uh, we're feeling that Ben Tenkor will get the nod in this one. Yeah, also like the thing with Saar was like a lower back injury, which mm. those are pretty hellish. You know, like they, they, they put strain on your legs and it did seem like Saar was struggling at times. He, he kept me slipping all over the place. It just seemed like he just wasn't in the right shape for the game. Ben Tenkor, on the other hand, is someone like if you, if you just, even if you look at his stats, you just see he's just an all-round player. He plays well in every area of the game. So it's like you wouldn't put him in a six. He is just an all-round player. Mm -hmm. He's a perfect link player between a really good six and a, a good ten, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, I'm really excited about it. I thought he was brilliant when he came on. I think his little um, nod to Porro was brilliant because mm -hmm. you saw him in the replay. You saw him look up before he did it. He's just a super intelligent player. And he's starting to get those... Um press resistant moments back yeah, where you can yeah. turn and, and charge into space where I felt like you know but in that period like January time he was kind of struggling in those moments yeah. I felt and giving the ball away actually yeah that's I think classic his, lack of confidence yeah but now that he's coming through that it seems yeah. and um, I think he's starting to play really well so I think Bentacle is going to play I also think he's really good like against low blocks mm. like he's kind of like a Madison on the other side because he like tries to dart in and put little behind the, the, the wall you know he, he He's a very fast-thinking player, and I think you need a player like that to, to break down. If they're going to sit back, if they get a lead or whatever and they sit back, you're going to need someone like him. Uh, in the number 10 position, we are going to go for James Madison, another player there's a lot of talk about because he's not in the best of form at the moment. Mm. Um, he's a player who, uh, obviously, he's a big player for Tottenham and one of our vice-captains, but... Are you at all concerned with his current form? Because obviously he's come back from injury since January now. Um, mm. Hasn't obviously started the season with the house out, like a house on fire. Hasn't quite hit those heights ever yeah. since uh, that period. Is it a case for you of um, you just keep playing him? He will get there, or is that, is he playing bad enough where you feel like he has to come out of the team? I don't know if he's been playing bad enough. He still does loads of he, he play. He's plays in moments right now, mm. you know, which is. Uh, again, it's a, it's a player trying to recover their confidence when they just can't get... It's just not there the whole time. But he, he does show little moments of class. Um, he, he's really good on the ball. He doesn't really lose the ball that, that often. It's just whether or not he's showing for the ball. Then he, if, if he's like... When Madison's on, it's like he the whole spectrograph of the you know his whole scope of the game is is huge mm -hmm. you know um but when he's not he kind of goes a little bit deep kind of gets a little bit lost the passes don't come fast enough uh, he holds on to the ball a little bit he tries to force it a, a, a ball at a nowhere pass mm -hmm. and it's like just simple stuff you know um i would have loved to seen uh maybe i don't know if it, right for this game but i would have loved to seen in the last couple games if madison is struggling a little bit to bring in a uh, Gio Lo Celso because when are we ever going to know if he has got it in him to run a mm. whole game you know every time he's come on for me he's been brilliant mm -hmm. he's affected the game he could have had assists last week if Kula was on form so um, but again it's like I, I wouldn't be surprised if Madison has in his contract that if I'm fit I play you know <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me at all a player like that coming for a fee he came for I wouldn't be surprised but and also the benefit is if you do keep playing him you recover his confidence yeah. and that's too high a reward to not play him. I, f I feel like Mad with Madison at the moment, I actually don't think he's playing as bad as a lot of people say. I just yeah. feel like what's missing is... He set the is, bar. So yeah, he said, first of all, he set the bar incredibly high. I just feel like he's playing like he usually does, except minus a little bit of magic he mm. usually brings. Yeah. Those little bit of, you know, when he gets in that final third, that little um, like unlock of the defence or that long-range shot that he can yeah. bring. And those are right now what's missing for one reason or another. I actually think in general play, he's still twisting and yeah, turning yeah. away from players and dictating things. He's still got that. 
for one reason or another when he gets in the final third it's not quite happening but I do back back that to change the more game yeah. time he has he's the um, kind of guy if he scores a goal yeah then all of a sudden it just takes off you know on the right hand side we're going to go for Brennan Johnson obviously a player in great form at yeah. the moment I think it's six goals goal contributions in his last seven games um, keeping Kulisevsky out of the team it's yeah. fair to say and I do think with um, Newcastle's depleted defence at the moment this is a really good opportunity for him to really take the game to them yeah I think he's going to be key I think him and Werner him and Werner are like in the form they're in you know they set up each other at times mm. you know and that's that's that key that uh, Ange came in with Ange Ball was that you know wingers kind of set up wingers. Um, he's fast. I think I think it's a no-brainer. You know you can't watch Cooler right now and, and think he should be starting these games. You watch uh, Johnson. He's breaking the line. He's running at people. His little touches. He's getting in behind. He's doing a lot of stuff that I don't know if you would have thought that was in Johnson's mm. game. You know, and then he's getting to the line and beautiful cutbacks and stuff. So. I, I'm enjoying watching Johnson right now. It's brilliant to see. This is his first season. Did we really even expect him to have this impact in his first season? I mean, obviously came here for a lot of money, but I think I think we're seeing a lot of good stuff. And I, and I don't think he's anywhere near his ceiling either. 100%. What I really like about Johnson recently <laughs> is actually... Obviously, we know he can run down the byline and get that ball in, but actually, recently, he's starting to be central runs where he's yeah. looking for that run yeah, centrally yeah. to dart through and look for those av other avenues. And yeah. if you remember that chance that um, Son hit the post with against Forrest, it's because <clears> Johnson <throat> didn't go to the bar. They actually ran yeah, diagonally. Yeah. He ran centrally and then opened up the space there. Well, the goal he scored was a couple of games ago where he came from the wing and he made a central forward run and he yeah. got the tap in yeah so yeah. I think he's starting to add those, those little little different things yeah. to his game making him a bit more unpredictable yeah because I think he can play him. as a nine he plays it for um, for Wales mm. you know I think he's got that in him I think he's had training as a number nine obviously with his speed you want yeah. him on the wing here you know um, yeah Oh, do you want an ice cream? Brains? Anyone you, ice cream? You fancy I'm one? A um, flick. Maybe after this. Look, it's the weather for it, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> all right, number nine position. We are going to go with Hyun Min Son. Um, obviously, with Charlottes and still out, so it's a bit of a no-brainer. What's interesting in this game, obviously, Newcastle are missing Sven Botman, um, and I think Jamal Lascelles got injured, so likely to have Fabian Schar and Dan Burner centre-back. So when you look at... Not kind the of fastest. Pay, not the fastest. And if new, I think with Newcastle being at home... They will try somewhere yeah. to go at us and attack yeah. us. They're, I don't think they're just going to sit up. So, yeah, I think Son will be licking his lips a bit with yeah. any space in behind here. Yeah, I want Porrell to be getting into that half space and, and playing that ball through. Madison on the other side, putting Werner in. I think that, I mean, that's. Son should be licking his lips to this. Mm. I mean, I, I, I fancy Son to, to bag a, a brace. On the flip side, if Newcastle do sit in a bit of a low block, obviously Byrne is and Shaw very physical yeah. defenders. It's going to be very difficult for him to get any space in that. But with Newcastle, as I said, being at home, they do usually look to attack their opponents yeah. and be aggressive. They don't like to sit back. So uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and on the left-hand side, Timo Werner, another player where there's a lot of discussions at the moment. Uh, should he be made permanent? Is he doing well enough? Obviously, he got another assist against Forrest last week for the own goal and a really good performance. Um, I think he's a man in form as well I've been liking his recent displays and I think this is another game where Newcastle could be could offer him a lot of uh, encouragement in this one yeah and I think how Timo has to look at every game from, from here going on you know, obviously he's on loan is just make impact you know, mm. do what the manager says. Break the lines, get to the, the byline, and you know, just keep getting those assists. If you can score, that would be great. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That'll be that would really be really good, fantastic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just keep playing, and you know, end of the season, if he's sitting on 10, 12 goal involvements, I don't, I don't know how you don't just for what 17 million. I don't know how you don't just make that happen as a backup, mm. whatever. Um, he's the he's the one right now who's doing. Ange Ball, him and Johnson, mm. you know exactly what you what you would want from from Ange Ball. So, I, I, I gotta say, he has grown on me. As a striker, it drives me nuts <laughs> when he gets through on goal and uh, yeah, that's when he gets <laughs> in those one on one one on one situations and he just yeah. misses him every time, doesn't he? That's a really frustrating thing. But uh, but what I like about it is clearly he hasn't let those misses get to him and no. and he keeps doing what Ange wants him on from on his left wing goes on the outside just cuts it across the face of goal and the chances come or he goes starting to get that goal. kind of Perisic feeling about him when he gets the ball in that you know by the box you're starting to think he's he's going to get to the line and, and cross this 
it seems if, like you know what he's going to do, but you yeah. can't stop it. Yeah, because he's got that little burst of pace. And if, if Son and Johnson are just expecting it, because he's put, in the last few games, he's put, um, he's obviously got his assists and, but actually he's put so many good balls in that mm. haven't gone in the back of the net. If you think about mm-hmm. them, the actual ones that were missed, goalkeepers have made a great save, but also some that have just been put in at that area of uncertainty. And our players have just kind of not, almost not expected it, mm. you know? And so, if the players are less on their heels when they play with him, they know he's going to get to the byline. You know, I think Brandon Johnson plays like that with him. He's mm-hmm. like, hey, I'm, I'm rating he's going to get to the byline. I'm going to get there. You yeah, know? he knows. So, uh, yeah, I think that I think that's a great front line. All right, let's go through the 11 then one more time. Vicario in goal, Porro, Romero, Van de Ven, Anu, Doggy along the back line, Basuma, Bentacle, Madison in the centre, Johnson, Werner and Hyun Min Son. That is the 11 we're going for. Let me know in the comment section below if you agree or disagree with our predicted lineup. What do you reckon the score will be if that's the lineup? That's a good lineup. If that, I could see us having a, and it's very rare for me to give a over positive uh, <laughs> score prediction. But uh, I'm going to go 3-1. 3-1. 3-1 Spurs. I've said I saw a bit of a goal fest. I went for 4-2 in my predictions. Oh, okay. um, I, I see Newcastle, Isaac, Barnes and Gordon. Yeah, like, front they do three. have threat. I see them hurting, but they're, um, their midfield and defence is so depleted. I really see us really taking advantage of that. So yeah. I went for 4-2. Um, but let's get into the overall match preview. We'll look at the game in general. Um, obviously, Newcastle coming into this game, um, a bit of better form, I would say, than um, they have been generally this season. Last five games, two wins, two losses and a draw. Uh, eight goals scored, um, nine goals conceded. So they're definitely leaky at the back. But look at that home form, though. Uh, unbeaten mm. in five three draws and two wins so they're not um winning lots but you know they're not they're very very hard to beat away from uh, at home at at st james's our away form as well coupled with that only one win in the last five as well so is there there something to say that maybe looking at that you know how they are at home how we are away is it fanciful to think we could go there and win based on that (sighs) change my prediction (laughs) (laughs) also how many have we won in the brown Phuket, I call it. Well, we yeah, the brown Phuket. Um, we <laughs> drew away at Fulham in the cup and lost on penalties. Mm-hmm. We drew away at City three three. Oh yeah. And we lost four two away at Brighton, I believe. Uh, so yeah. hasn't been the best results. Oh, we did beat Luton though one nil. Yeah. Uh, okay. Kenilworth Road. So we did get a win there, but we don't have the best record um, in the in in that brew. I think it's. Uh, Cappuccino kit, I think they call Cappuccino. it. Cappuccino. Cappuccino. Um, yes. But look, Newcastle, I think the, the the lesson there is that Newcastle, doesn't matter how depleted they are, they're always a very, very tough team to play against. Yeah. But what I would notice is they do tend to concede lots of goals. For example, uh, at home to Luton, 4-4. At home to uh, Bournemouth, um, 2-2. At home to uh, Man City, they lost 3-2. Yeah. Um, at home to Nottingham Forest, they lost 3-1. Wow. At home to um, West Ham, just being, they lost 4-3. So, conceding, uh, sorry, they won 4-3, but they conceded three goals. Yeah. So, uh, so that's going to be a basketball match. So they concede tons of goals, is, yeah. my, is my, uh, I guess, my uh, what I'm taking away from that. And uh, I think with those games, they probably had a better backline. They're going to have even in this game, they've got even more injuries. Um, yeah. But... They do concede a lot, but they score. They're massive yeah. threat on the counter. You've got the Isaac, top but Isaac Barnes uh, recently. Anthony Gordon's been in fine form. Mm-hmm. Bruno Guimaraes in the centre is a fantastic yeah. midfielder. Yeah. So it's going to be a really, really difficult, a difficult tie. But how do we kind of go about uh, making sure we're not getting hit in the transitions like a lot of the other teams and making sure we're really exploiting that depleted yeah, back line. That, that comes into like, who do you actually pick as your six? You know, and, and then like, how does Romero play? Does mm. he step forward a little bit? I think it's it's going to be a, a, a game of who can dominate the their opponent's final third, you know? Like who can like really put, and dominate the ball in the other player, other team's half, um, because it looks like both teams can score loads of goals. Who's got the better defense, though? I would say us by mm-hmm. a long shot, you know. Um, but then, you know, we we, we kind of give a silly goal away every now and then. That's why I went three one because we we drop a silly goal, you know. Even in a performance that should be a shutout, we drop a silly goal. Um, we've got the better goalkeeper. You would think that we would be able to contain, and then our 
the way our attack is playing with the two fast wingers, you would hope that we would expose this weakness at the back. Um, mm. But the pro- yeah, the problem is you look at our pre as you say our previous few games, yeah, and um, we we do have a ba- massive tendency of giving away sloppy yeah. goals, yeah. Um, slob big chances. If you look at our head to head with Newcastle over the last obviously five games, we beat them obviously battered them in December. Yeah. That was one of our best performances of the season where we yeah. beat them four um, one. Although. You know, before that was one of the worst games in Tottenham's recent history. That six-one defeat at yeah. St James's Park. That was our last visit there. We were five. We were five nil down within twenty-one minutes, and it um, obviously a, a thousand memes were made of our watch along for that one. I remember. <laughs> um, the pre previously to that, obviously we beat them under Conte five-one. Um, the one we won, we lost two-one away at home. Was when Loris gave away that stupid goal to, C- to Callum Wilson. So a yeah. bit of a mixed result over the last uh, five games. But in terms, of obviously the most recent one in December, that was also against a much depleted Newcastle team. Yeah. I remember Trippi had a very difficult day that day. And um, they, they, I think they, this season they've been like the worst hit team, and it's been just like never ending. Mm-hmm. You know, have they? It's been like almost all of the season, you know, mm. after a certain point. And, th- and this is the problem. I think this is what um, Andrew was alluding to with, like, getting into the Champions League when you're not really ready squad-wise. Mm-hmm. And that sums up them because, like, all the games they've played early in the season have, have completely destroyed their team, you know? And I think, yeah, you can see here the extensive injury list they do have. Botman, the cells, Tonali obviously suspended with his betting charge. Lewis Miley, Callum Wilson, Joe Linton, Pope, Almiron, Joe Willock, Livramento and Kieran Trippier. Wow. Um, unbelievable uh, kind of injury list there. Uh, yeah. Never ending almost um, injury list. And obviously even players like Lewis Miley, who had a lot more game time yeah. because uh, they had injuries. He's now injured. That's a lot of key players some, there. some people argue, though, they have this over aggressive style that's how they like kind of um, close the gap the quality gap by being yeah. really aggressive being on the front foot um, making sure they're outrunning the opposition and maybe Eddie Howe hasn't adapted to those extra games and, mm. and because he's kept with that aggressive kind of style it's led to a lot of his injuries and look you know, you could argue with Spurs changing up the way they've played. Has that caused a lot of injuries as well? Yeah. I think that aggression. So does Eddie Howe kind of have to take any responsibility for the amount of injuries it's the they've had? the same thing as Burnley and Spurs. You know, like, obviously, Ange has a style of play. Bur- Burnley come up with a style of play. And then the reality is, you know, you, you once you don't have the certain players to play that style mm-hmm. of play adequately then you're in a hiding and nothing. So you've, you've kind of got to adapt. And they haven't really been adapting because I think what you lose when you all of a sudden adapt, you can't just take your reserve team and go and chain them a different style of play, you know. Mm. It's, it, but then it's this idea of like, you know, in the Prem, it seems like you need a plan A, plan B, plan C. Mm-hmm. You know, because you play three different types of class teams, you know. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think that's just the, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at how many of their mm-hmm. key players are out and how long it's been for mm-hmm. some of them, these players. Um, I mean, when was the last time we even saw Joel Lennon? Like early Long part time. of the season. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you if you're looking at that lineup though, look, it's very very depleted. I think the big areas for sure um, there that, that that you've got a target. Obviously, those two centimeters, Anderson and Longstaff. I think if they if they, if them two are playing there. I think those have to be massively targeted because Bentancourt and Madison have to think we can get the better of those two. Obviously, Bruno Gimoreg is a fantastic yeah. player, but he can't do it by himself. Yeah. And obviously, Longstaff and Anderson, hard workers, but not the best technically. So you put them under pressure, you think they, they, they you have the feeling they might buckle. And if you look at that back line, I yeah, think a- Johnson and Werner have to be licking their lips at those fullbacks. Everyone, yeah. Sonny's got to be thinking he can get in behind Burn, mm. you know, quite easily. And you think Kraft, you know, he's uh, not the... F- uh, and Lewis Hall is also a doubt for this game, so he might not be 100% fit. You've got to think if Johnson and Werner, if they're running at their fullbacks, just get the ball to them as quickly as possible, they might have big, big struggles dealing with them. Yeah, and I think looking at that lineup, you, you would think Madison's got to be licking his lips as well, get mm. on the ball and then start, like, really dominating um, just in the second third of their, their opposition. Um, yeah, I think... <sighs> Okay, I'm changing my my, 
<laughs> potentially a bag. But it's a difficult one. one because <laughs> you know, it's a difficult one, is it? Because you, you look at their depleted team, you think how it can why be quite should, inspiring. Like why should we not be confident winning that game? And then you but then you look at their home form, you look at our away from think, you know, based on that it's gonna be very, yeah, very difficult. We're not exactly so, flowing in, in the most confidence. You know, we've got mm. a few wins again, you know, under our sails, but um, and then them at home, knowing that you've got a whole, it's like almost like a hit to nothing. You know, it's mm. like, you know, let's just go for it. You, you know, know, let's just fight. You know what could be the difference maker? A bit like the Villa game where they had that extra game, so they were very tired going to that second half, and we ended yeah. up running riot. Obviously, with their depleted team, if we can kind of keep it like, make sure they don't have like a one or two goal lead going yeah. into that second half, I think that's where we can take advantage because we're yeah. going to we're going to have the fitness on them yeah. um th they're not going to be, be able to change it as well with their substitutions we're going to have more options yeah. off the bench yeah so i think you would think long, the longer the game goes on if we're level or even winning going to those latter stages you would think that's where we can take full advantage of their depleted yeah. team and this is where like um you know people highly criticize your know, spurs fans highly criticize that we're a second half team mm. you know but it's because we like try to put a team to the sword for 45 minutes and break them down, break them down, break them down, then keep them going even faster mm -hmm. and then try to put it on them now that when they're depleted. With a, with a team that is depleted with injury, that's not going to be good for them mm -hmm. because they're going to want to like take things slow, reserve, you know, like maybe a couple of, um, you know, switches might help them a little bit, but if you're putting the team to the sword, if you're just trying to dominate, hold the ball, constantly make them think, move from side to side, you know, don't tire yourself out in the second half, bang, just and just lay it on them non-stop. That's where you're going to get a lot of goals, I think. Mm, I completely agree. And I think looking at that back line, looking how depleted it is, if we can't take full advantage of that, that would be some 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 sort of concern because you even look look at the lights of, you know, West Ham scored three goals there last yeah. week and uh, Luton have got four goals there recently. So yeah. you've got to be thinking, at least we have, look, there's one thing maybe... And, um, not creating the chance, um, sorry, creating the chances, and obviously if you're finishing off on the day, then it is. But if we go there and we we get dominated, we don't not able to create chances, that would be a big concern. Because I'm looking yeah. at that midfield and and defence, I'm like, if you can't create chances against that, that's yeah. that's a big worry. Especially now when it's coming to the crux of the season, where a lot you you've got to be thinking as players that like. Oh little bit of an eye on next season we got to get you know get champions league there's a, there's a you know a lot of games next season i want to be in this squad i want to nail down my position mm. there is a fight going on for for the mid, midfield positions you would think like this whoever plays whoever starts in the midfield or even whoever's coming on goes i need to make my position you know so so you would hope that players are good at this game with as much as they're in on the line you know like villa's playing arsenal this week mm -hmm. you know we ne kind of need this win can't really mm. slip up there might be a draw there with, the, with arsenal no, Liverpool and City coming up. Can't we got one this, this game? This is one of the games that you're looking. And that's a, always a problem for us because when we go into games, going we just have to win this game. Yeah, it's you always know, a worry. But then we'll the probably lose forward. this and beat City or something. That's usually yeah. how it works for Tottenham, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I agree. This is the kind of game where if you look, if you're earmarking potential points in our next seven games. Um, obviously nothing's taken for granted but this is a game where you're thinking we, if we can get three points here it'll be a massive massive bonus yeah. going into the last stretch and with Villa probably going to drop points on, on the weekend as well it can go a long way extending that gap and giving us a bit of breathing space it's yeah. interesting looking at Newcastle though they've been having such a poor season but currently eighth only two points off sixth so you know, do, do, you know, given how difficult their season's been, if they ended up sick, that would be, yeah. that'd be quite decent. Yeah. And yeah. they'll probably, they'll, that, they'll definitely take the pressure off Eddie Howe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's been tough. They, they don't have a bad style of play. I actually love what Eddie Howe has done there in his time. Um, he's got the, like, he's got the best sort of players, like Longstaff. And, mm. you know, um, they've, Especially when they're at home, I seem I I feel like they have something else power in them, you mm -hmm. know, like all that energy. They're like a club that it's horrifying to go there, you know, because that that crazy energy in that stadium just like lifts all the players. But um, you'd still have to think um, they would be coming to this game. Eddie Howe would be coming to this game with a, a with way more of a head scratcher, going, "How do we handle the Spurs team?" You know, like. The only way we should be kind of like dropping points is if, is if like four or five players all have howlers, you know, mm -hmm. in, in different departments mm -hmm. of the pitch. But um, I, I also do see it like it's a, it is a bit of a hit to, to nothing for them mm. because it's like we're so compounded with injuries. The, the expectations got to be off. 
let's just go out there, give it a go, let's see what we can get. And when that that kind of mentality is on, that's where they can be very dangerous. And also, a the, wounded animal is very dangerous when it's backed in a corner. One hundred percent. And they've got great players, especially in the yeah. forward line. Especially yeah. in the forward line, and they're very good in transition. I remember watching that game early in the season. They played Man City, and they were just, uh, especially in the first forty-five minutes, they just really. Um, clinically were hitting Man City on mm. that counter. J Gordon was running right down the left-hand side. Isaac was causing so many problems in behind. And if we're, obviously we know we're going to be pushing up, we're going to be, you know, dominating the ball. And if we're not careful, they can definitely hit us in those transitions. Yeah. And if we give them too many, if we give them too many transitions, they've got the players to hurt us. Yeah. If we give them two or three good quality chances, they've got the they've got the players who are good enough to score two or three goals yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in those chances and all of a sudden you can find yourselves 2-0 down yeah. without even knowing so that's what you've got to guard against you just got to make sure that we're not um, sloppy on the ball giving them these early chances uh, giving them the advantage going into that second half because I do think the first half for Newcastle where it could be won I yeah. felt like come the second half they might start to tire a bit they're not going to have the subs to re, uh, yeah. regain the energy or, or, the, or the good enough subs to replace Barnes and Gordon and Isaac yeah. so if we can keep them out for the first 45 minutes even if it means what going in at nil nil yeah that could be really crucial to just making sure we win that game because they are one of the most dangerous teams on transition because i feel like if it turns into a basketball game that will suit us because i think their defense yeah. is so depleted they won't want it to be that i think if they sit back kind of play play it like they did against man city they did end up losing that game three two but they were very close to holding them out i think de bruyne mm. came on and saved them that day yes. if i remember mm -hmm. rightly yeah, yeah, yeah. um so if they play as similar to how they played that Man City game, that really organised tight, making sure that there's no spaces in between the lines and hit them in the transition, that's when this can become a dangerous game. Yeah. We've just got to hope that... Especially I with the way that we play with our, our like fullbacks going very central and then going up in a... a Mm. You know, really affecting the attack. Sometimes, I mean, like Gordon at, and Barnes will be licking their lips with that. Paro's goal last week. He's in the box. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, if a team's going to want to play, you know, their goalkeeper gets the ball in hand, a long throw, and they, that's it. Exactly. You know, be right in behind. As much as I think Johnson and Vern will be licking their lips at. Um, had the two Newcastle fullbacks. I also think Gordon and Barnes will be thinking, if we get a transition, all that space to run into, I'm going to yeah. be in 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 a dreamland essentially yeah. if we allow them those transitions. And even like Van de Ven's speed won't really be much of an asset at that point because he will be then covering, you know, other players. You mm. know, Romero had to go and cover here. Van de Ven has to move over. Then there's space if it's three versus two at that point. So, say, so it you know. can be a very very dangerous game. So we just have to make sure that. We're not being sloppy. We're not giving them very easy uh, um, reasons to transition. If we're, if we're allowing them, if we do give the ball away, make sure it's in their box so we have time to get, get it back and not giving it away in the middle third and that kind of thing. Does that change how you probably view who should have been the, the number six then? Because, <sighs> because us getting on the ball and turning and also us protecting our defence and, and being as a block might come in very useful it's certain the last few minutes of the first half we just need to not lose a goal mm. you know the second half if we are up you, you need to protect the league things like that like you, are you saying it should be Hoybier or you, you so assume part it? of me starts to think that might have been you know the right decision um just just considering on how he came in but then again if it is like five minutes from the end and he does one of those hail mary it's, passes yeah you, and gives a ball away <laughs> that's the problem <laughs> i kind of feel like the reason why um, I I would actually play Hoybier in, in this game, I think he'll go Basuma, but I, why I'd play Hoybier is because when, let's say they're looking to transition Newcastle and they're looking to play it through the centre, I think Hoybier is much more likely to press and nick the ball back yes, than Basuma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basuma is going to be a lot more reactive. He's going to step back and, and they, he'll allow them to play through and then he'll try and like... Uh, win a, a tackle a dribbler or something like that yeah. whereas bring a guy down in a dangerous area Hoybier, Hoybier, exactly Hoybier <laughs> is more likely to try and nick the ball or, or when there's a pass trying to get on top of them yeah. and then he, he tests your technical ability a mm. bit more and when you have Longstaff and Anderson there I think they would they, they would not like that like Hoybier in their face all the time just like yeah. closing them down whereas Basuma 
is a lot more, is a bit more reactive. He likes to step back a bit, a bit more. I don't think he likes to confront as much. As much as he can do the defensive job, he does make tackles, inceptions. I feel like he doesn't confront as much as Hoybier. So I think that combative nature would lead to Hoybier just allowing us to dominate them a bit more. But then again, I feel like uh, Basuma will allow the, us to dominate them a bit more in possession in a way. Mm, so yeah. it's kind of pick your poison in a way, it swings around about. I'm just very, very worried about them winning the ball back and hitting us in behind very quickly. Yeah. That is what's something we've got to make sure we don't we don't allow them to do, especially in that first half. Because yeah. if we allow them a goal lead or two goal lead and then we, we allow them to sit back, mm. then we're in a bit of trouble. Yeah, because I, I see our attack is... You know when we tr we do this thing where we try to get into the oppo's half and then dominate the ball with side to side, side which obviously drains your mm. opponent. It's a good co it's a good tactic. Obviously your stats go up and you're controlling the game. But there's a part of me that kind of wants their midfielders to come into our half mm -hmm. and try get and try to do that to us because I think our ability to get Madison on the ball and bang through the lane mm -hmm. or someone you know our speed in behind like puts them to the sword you know like Poro stepping up and then putting the ball through mm -hmm. the lane and then Suns in with space behind the defense mm -hmm. I think we're way better when we play like that whereas if when we go up and it gets super super tight, tight I think it yeah. makes it a little easier there's for no space defense. for Ron and Johnson to run into yeah that especially kind of the way we want to play you know go fast and behind ball across goal you know mm. um, so I so and then even when you think about playing that way I think Hoybier is a little bit better mm. because he can get the ball turned and he can put a beautiful long ball or a ball through the lane that's his kind of like almost his game you know that he does mm. all the time for Denmark as well so it's an interesting one to play that way though you have to kind of have a uh, here's the argument for Basumas you actually mm. have to have a, a uh, a six who kind of goes deep and lets people try come on, mm. you know, and then because then it's like a little pass to the side, and then we're away, and then they're like, oh, oh yeah, we're gone, you know. So it, it is, it is horses for courses, you know. Some parts of me thinks, well, then maybe Benton is the six at that point because he might be able to do that better. One play one. saw there, maybe. Oh, sorry, yeah. I mean, it's it's a difficult decision that Wait, uh, Anderson do they, to make. They have the Anderson and and uh, Longstaff, and Longstaff with Gimaros. Playing in a double pivot or two setters or and and is Gimaros? I think usually it's Bruno just sitting. Oh, Bruno sitting in the yeah, six. Yeah, Bruno sits oh, in the I six. Deep line playing. Maybe. Yeah, wow, which is okay. interesting. Yeah, um, he because he um, yeah for, for the, he they like him to dictate the play, so they have mm. him sitting the deepest usually. And that's one thing actually. To think, thinking about that, that's one thing we could take, in a way take advantage of because yeah. he he can get wound up. Uh, Bruno, yeah, yeah. and he makes Madison a lot of fouls. Him he legs a lot, of fouls. a lot of fouls. If we yeah. could get Bruno sent off, then the game's won. I think because yeah. they they would have no control. He's very good that that he could just him, you know. Obviously, with a bit of help from Longstaff and Anderson, a uh, bit of you know uh, work rate, he can really uh, help dictate that midfield. He's that good. Yeah. So if we can wind him up, get on his uh, wrong side, and you know get him to get a yellow, get um, yeah. get him to get frustrated, then I think. Um, that could be a really good avenue to make sure that Newcastle aren't getting that advantage. That's an interesting battle. It could be one of the key battles of the match. Two mm. tens versus each other. You know, mm. Gamerish versus uh, Madison. You know, Madison of late has not had the greatest head on him. Mm. You know, true. Uh, he could have been sent off as well last week. To sign up for the UFC. Last <laughs> week, you know? um, but they, but if, if they if they wind each other enough, someone could crack. You know. That's why it's really interesting that they play him as a six because I think he's a world class ten, mm. um, and which is great if he's not not in controlling the ball around our box. That's fantastic. He did score the winner, I believe, last week, didn't he, against uh, Fulham? But from what I've seen, he does usually tend to play um, as the number six. Yeah, a bit, a bit very central. Um, mm. So it'll be interesting to see how, how he performs in 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 that game. Um, Obviously, there maybe like Tenali or other players would have probably done the role, and then he would have pushed up. Yeah, I think a lot will depend on how Eddie Howe sets up. If he's if he, if he thinks it's a home game, we're going to go for it. Then I think that will massively benefit us. If he th if he's a bit smarter and thinks, you know, if he treats us like he treated Man City, they've got a much better chance of getting a result. Even I, even then, I think we still got the upper hand. But I think I'm a bit more scared of that kind of situation yeah, because that home game, they, you know, like you're saying, like they're they're not that far off. They can mm. they can get Europe, you know, all to play for, you know, hmm. go after it. You know, that's I think we're hoping for is that they come out for a game to play. But then they could be in in great, you know, mm. they could have the 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 wind in the back. But 
we kind of I think a basketball game favors of us yeah, more than them. I think know. definitely true. All right, well, having said all that, are you sticking with that three-one prediction? It's a tough one. Nah, it's, a, it's a little um, bit of a tough one now. I'm yeah, still sticking with 4-2. I'm, yeah, I'm sticking with 3-1. We're both going for Tottenham wins here, uh, which Josh well, King which will not be happy no, about. you know. They're going to be <laughs> and now we're definitely not going to win. <laughs> but pre look, Brains, thank you for joining me on today's live no stream. Worries. Thank you for talking about the Newcastle game. Let me know in the comments section below what your thoughts are on the game, what your score predictions are. That is all we have time for today. But looking forward to tomorrow, I'll be on the watch along with Barnaby Slater going through all the actions. So let's hope we come back from St. James's Park with all three points we'll see you all very very soon like subscribe and comment and as always come on you spurs